the groups that you see here, that means um, linear models, neural networks and support vector machines, they belong somehow together. And uh, decision trees and statistical learning is a completely different thing. And hence we have separated this a bit. We have um, selected some literature, but we will also prepare good articles, book excerpts for you to prepare. Here I step over. Here our reading starts. And um, this Roman one means we are in part one, the introduction. You can also see, if you go look at the bottom of the page, the encoding where we are, ML stands for machine learning, one stands for part one, and 10 is the 10th page. We Thank want you. to, yeah, sorry. Go, go ahead. I, I, I would have uh, the interruption regarding um, uh, ask, asking questions about the slides. Um, if that's okay. I'm sorry, did you get this? No, I'm I, uh, asking questions and how to ask questions. I mean, you, you are... Go ahead. I don't know what to what yeah, you yes, want. Okay, anyway. So um, uh, if you have questions regarding the slide, we want you to use the Moodle forums uh, on your respective Moodles. Um, and uh, so since, since we will not be able to, uh, uh, given the online situation, to always go through every single slide in detail, uh, uh, this is a flipped classroom and that means that you should prepare for uh, the meetings here and also prepare questions. And if you, uh, so part of the meeting will then be us answering the questions that you pose. Yes. We will answer all questions, we will clarify all things. Even if this is a flipped classroom, we will take full responsibility to you to explain these. Flipped classroom, uh, but also means that we do not spend every week two hours that you listen to Martin or me. This is rather kept short because the slides are very well prepared and the material that we selected gives you a lot of background. Another aspect is that machine learning, like also other things in statistic, logics, or mathematics require a deep understanding and learning. And this takes time. If I read a machine learning book or a machine learning paper or some formula in Wikipedia or somewhere else, sometimes I spend 10 or 20 minutes or two hours on a single page because it is not simply reading and then getting it. And this means you should take your time to understand this we show you our understanding in the slides, and if you have questions, we will answer this. For a topic like machine learning, which requires that you understand the things by yourself, this is a good approach to do this. There's no perfect speed which helps all of us. I now start with a few examples, and uh, to give you an idea of what, how machine learning tasks can look like. Here you see, uh, examples on the left hand side, the old Beetle and the new Tesla Model 3, I guess. And um, they could be examples from our database. We have perhaps 20, 50, or hundreds of these examples. And uh, the sums up and sums down side, uh, sign uh, tells us that people say this is not a good car or this is a good car. And then Having this database in our background, we get presented a new car. This here on the right hand side, and we ask ourselves, where does it belong to? And um, of course, we can do some matches regarding color size, everything, and come to a decision. And here is, you see already, if you take something from the real world, the real car, the real beta, the real M3, the question is, what do we put into the computer? And at this point, machine learning starts to become difficult and interesting. Many books start having already a list of features. And this careful selection of features, which you have to do here, will you take the engine power, the age, or the price of the car, this decides about the success of machine learning. This process of selecting 
features of the real world and encoding them into the computer. It's called model formation, Modellbildung in German. Here we see another example. These are simply sheets where customers for credit approval at the bank are required to fill out. They want to have a new credit and they have to tell something about them, whether they are house owners, what's their yearly income, what they can repay per month and so on. And based on such data, we can learn rules. Yes, we can, and this is the reason why we present this example here. You see, this is a symbolic representation of something machine learning learned. If income is about 40,000 and credit period is less than three years, or if you are a house owner, then we will give you the credit. But this is, this is then based on the uh, experience of uh, lots of previous credits that have been given. So these rules do not don't come out of the blue. They come out of the experience of the bank in being successful with their credits or unsuccessful. Yes, and we, uh, I will uh, just take some time and I uh, hope you can see this. We can use such data here as database to learn rules. And the data here in the database was this. We will get a bit more formal in the next few slides on this. I, I will present a third task to, to show you the whole picture. This is a, um, is a, gives us insight about the first um, approaches of, of engineers to do autonomous driving. And there are some, there are nice videos provided here. And at the moment, I won't click on them because I haven't tested this on Zoom, but um, in the slides, um, um, uh, you will, if you click on here, you will get a zoom about the first approaches to, to uh, getting cars driving. And I have prepared this here. Uh, now I see it. Do you, you can see just, video? just try it. Come on. Yeah. Do you see the video? Okay. Perhaps it's a little bit uh, not as smooth as you see it, but we do see it. No sound, so you can talk. Are we even hear sound? Mm -hmm. A little bit. No, you can just talk, I guess. Yes. Um, what you see here, I stop here. Yeah? Here you see interpretations of the camera, of the viewing system, what the camera is seeing. I've presented this, uh, selected this because. Um, the mechanisms, the idea to take neural networks to do this has not changed, but the effectiveness and the success has changed a lot. I will contrast this video to the one year old uh, video of um, which from a hacked Tesla, um, where this has, uh, which has also cameras inside and also takes a look, namely at the streets of Paris. Um, this is really impressive. Um, I don't know at which speed you see this. Um, you are inside a Tesla and the Tesla is looking at the surroundings. And uh, you see these colored boxes which um, measure the vehicles, their speed from where they are coming and what they are trying to do. And um, this is all in real time. Pedestrians are also uh, found and seen and all this happens you see during driving, or here this, 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 this car is standing. And this is, um, assessment is really fantastic. However, the problem is what to do with all this information. Yeah? Uh, getting all this information is one thing, but um, what to do, what, how to drive, how fast to drive, these are very complicated decisions. Autonomous driving is one of the biggest challenges which we have at the moment. Okay, and um, what you see here on this side is um, a kind of neural network. And um, we call these elements perceptrons. We have an input here. 
and uh, then we have a classification here. This is very simple, but this is the idea how this works. Having seen this task, we can ask ourselves, what does machine learning mean? Yeah? Machine learning means can mean everything. Everything where a computer program gets information somewhere from cases which are encoded, which encodes experience. And this computer program is tailored to solve a certain kinds of classes. We have seen three classes before, a review of a car quality, symbolic assessment whether we could give a credit loan, and the third, to look out in the world and decide how to drive. And if a computer program learns from such data for one of these tasks and can measure its quality, then we can say it is said to learn. There are three basic learning paradigms, supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. I just uh, mention them here. Sometimes we ask them in examination. Most learning tasks that you have seen and you are thinking about, if you think about machine learning as supervised learning tasks. Supervised learning means there's a teacher who knows everything, like God's eye. This teacher knows what's right and what is wrong. The teacher is there, the teacher can be asked. The teacher's knowledge is encoded often in a database. Unsupervised learning, by contrast, means there is no such teacher. You have something interesting in the world, but you don't know what, and the problem has to find out whether there is something interesting. The problem can find novelties, outliers, peaks in the data, and so on. Unsupervised learning is learning from, without having a goal and learning, real learning, Namely, what is happening? Did something happen? And for instance, if, if Google or other people have a, uh, companies have a lot of data at their disposal, want to find out something, they, they look first at the data and look for peaks, outliers, groups, clusters. And then they start interpreting this. The third class is reinforcement learning. It's somehow between the supervised learning and the unsupervised learning. Reinforcement learning means that the environment is a teacher. For instance, if an animal wants to learn crossing the street, the environment in the form of cars and other things helps the animal to learn what is dangerous and what not. The problem of reinforcement learning is that you might have to pay a price during the learning process. The advantage is that you don't need a teacher. You can put an agent or an autonomous learning being in a place, in an environment, and wait what happens. Computer scientists hope that this will be the future of learning. We put a bot into the internet, and a few days later, the bot becomes intelligent. However, we are far away from this kind, and at the moment, all our thinking in all, most of our work is on supervised learning. Yeah, a, a slide which tells us which kind of experience we can have. And here I go onto a chess example. That means playing chess because it shows a few interesting things. When you play chess and um, you would feedback it only by the final result, after you have done, the professional has done a lot of movies, you cannot learn a lot of this. You need, in fact, so-called direct feedback for each board configuration, the next best move. And this gives us to the next problem which boards and which moves are best to learn from. There's a so-called active learning paradigm which focuses on the interesting examples where you can learn most from.
The next and uh, also important question is, how far can we get with such a kind of experience? How can we measure this? And if we train something with our database, will it become strong enough to master situations in the wild? You see this at the moment with Tesla with a good working autopilot in certain settings, but if you bring this out into a real world in a big and crowded city, you might and, um, get uh, situations which you have never seen before. And then the question is, does the knowledge which you got presented in the learning process is enough to cope with these things? Perhaps you recall at the beginning of this reading that I said we have a so-called model formation to go from the real world to a model world. And in the real world, if you take the example chess, we have boards. And we want to go from boards to movers. Or we want to go from boards to values element R, which tell us this is a good board. The higher the value, the better the board. What you see on this slide is something I will skip. It shows how this in a reality solved by minimax strategy and alpha beta pruning, uh, chess and game things. I want to show you another thing, namely this. What you see here is a description which um, consists of the function gamma, which shall represent the human chess player, an O, which shall represent the board. And where we want to get to, if we want to replace the human by a function, why? And this function cannot work anymore on the boards. The function will work on a vector of board features. The function is what we call model function. This means um, some kind of regression model. And the mapping from the real world to the feature vector x is what we call model formation. And a very stupid model for playing chess is the following. The model function here y is simply the addition of certain features is a linear function. And the features here are quite stupid, are well, not so stupid. They count the number of pawns, pieces, or threaded pieces on the board. X1, for instance, is the number of black pawns on the board. Or X6 is the number of white pieces that are threaded. And for the moment, let's say, this is a good feature vector. What we need now to make our model function, our model complete, is to think about what are good weights for the features that we have measured in the real board. And these features are to be computed. And we use a database, and here you see the D, which I also showed you in the example from which we can learn this. There was a person, a chess grandmaster, for instance, and said, with this board here, which has this feature, set of features, I will give you this score. And now you see why machine learning has to do a lot with regression. Solving this problem here is a regression problem. And even if you take neural networks, these are often only complex regressors that work in a nonlinear way. There are other approaches to specify a model function simply by storing cases, by formulating rules. Neural networks are also kind, but we can consider them as nonlinear regressions and uh, also polynomials are also nonlinear regression functions here. All what I've explained is here written on this slide. I can skip over this. 
Again, because this is important and this will close a bit the introductory thing, I will describe the situation that you have to master. You go from the real world to the model world. In the real world, we are talking about objects, for instance, emails. We have a set of classes. If we take the email example, this is we want to decide whether a mail is a spam mail or whether a mail is not a spam mail. Let's call it hem mail here. And there's a human classifier or something who, somebody who has the real knowledge, who is able to take a mail and then do perfect decision. We call this the ideal classifier. And if you ask the human, please decide this for me, the human solves a classification task. He maps a given mail onto one of these classes. This is the, the correct observation. We will come to this uh, very well observed and you will see that we will not be able to do this. Um, we will call this problem, which is described here, a so-called label noise. Since our descriptions will be imperfect, we will never find the perfect description or formulate a perfect description of a spam mail versus a hand mail. We cannot form this injective function. There will be cases which will be classified wrongly as spam or hem because we do not have those features which really distinguish between them. But we should have in our minds an ideal situation. And this is the reason why I present this here. We have a loss of information if we go from the real world to the model world. And this loss defines the limits of our machine learning problem. We cannot repair this with an ever so fantastic learning machine. If the data is bad, garbage in, then we have garbage out. And um, actually many machine learning readings start with a given feature vector, but then the, the game is already won or lost. And hence in our course here, we will also integrate you with a large uh, task that we, you have to solve in a bit into the model formation problem. And we, uh, we decided and we are preparing a machine learning task for you, which is realistic, which is relevant, and which is also a bit of uh, complicated. And you will get the task to decide for a web page whether this is um, an informal web page or a formal web page, whether this is some um, advertising or whether this is some news. We call this, you, you will decide the genre of the page. Yeah, Martin, sorry. Um, no, I wasn't, uh, someone else activated the microphone. If you, if you uh -huh. want to ask questions, do not hesitate to interrupt also yes, via please. mic if you, if you dare. Don't worry, no, just do it. And um, by setting uh, this task, um, you get this task and you are free to choose the features. And then you have to learn and find out what are the features you want to see there from which you can learn so that you can in fact solve the task. The TAs will introduce this later on and um, during the lab classes. But um, what for the moment you should take is that the model formation going from the real world to the model world is, is decisive for the success of the machine learning process. Here I do this mathematically, characterization of the model world. I go one slide back, here's the real world, now comes the model world. Yes, I can explain this. Here, this slide, alpha takes the object from the real world, for instance, the mail, and extract those features that we are interested in. For instance, 
it counts the words, it counts the spelling errors, it counts, if we are talking about spam versus hem distinction, words that are typically for spam mail like money or so on. If we go to onto a chessboard, alpha means to translate a real chessboard into such features, which you see here. Okay. Alpha is a function that measures the object and that returns the feature vector. And eventually we have this feature vector, X. Here's a set of feature vectors and we call this feature space. For instance, if we go with the spam versus M situation with emails, the vectors encode the word frequencies for each mail. Each mail is one element herein and we count the word frequencies. The classes are the classes as before. We want to distinguish between spam and hem. And we now have a database of our feature vectors. That means each tuple which you see here is one male. The first element is a feature set of the male. The second element is a class, spam or hem. Hence, we also write it like this. Our examples are from this Euclidean space, X cross Z, features cross classes. Um, let's um, take in, in, uh, another starting point here where we see this. Um, in the real world, we have these classes here, spam or hem, and we have objects. And in the real world, there is a person, a machinery, something which is able to solve this. If we go to the computer, we do the model formation and build for each object a feature vector. So objects become elements in the feature space. We have a perfect classification because for each feature vector of an object, we eventually know where it stems from and we want to learn this function. And this is called machine learning. The approximation, here you see this, of what we see in the data set. So in this regard, Benno, uh, just for clarification, we assume that the C function, the classifier, uh, just is basically the same as the gamma function. Uh, although we do not know whether our feature spaces or features are strong yeah, enough uh, to actually do this distinguish this distinction. Right? The C function works um, on the features but delivers the same result um, as the gamma yeah. function. Yeah. The gamma function works on the real objects. Uh, the C function, which we get with our data set, it has namely the correct classes for feature vectors. Um, is in that sense perfect. Um, it uh, does no error because each feature vector gets the correct class. This is to be approximated by our function y. It will become clear, more clear, if we solve problems with this. And uh, you can read all what we have explained here in the remarks. What to round up the, the, the round trip now, we show you an algorithm that is able to learn, in fact. It is a quite old algorithm, least means squares. But this algorithm exhibits all elements that even the most modern machine learning algorithms have. The input is a set of training examples. Here again. I want to explain this. It is a feature vector 
and a correct class assignment. And what happens internally is that this set D is processed with a goal to compute a weight vector. The LMS, the least mean square algorithm says our model function is linear, we see it here. And we want to compute these weights, WO up to WP, this written in a dot product notation here. And the algorithm is quite primitive, but does its jobs. It starts by giving all weights random values. This is something every computer can do. It then selects an arbitrary element from our training set. This is also something the computer can do. It takes then these random weights, does this multiplication, here you see the a scalar product and gets a value y. This is of course a random value because we have random weights and they've taken some example. Why should this computed value have to do something with the correct class? Probably nothing. However, we compute this difference now here in this error line. And now the interesting things come. We, this is called happy in learning. We correct the weight, which was by now the random value set with this error. This is a weight, um, a learning rate. It's not important here. Important is this what you see here. We take the difference and change the weights with this product here. And this is not an arbitrary formula. It is in fact derivable and we will do this. Ah, yes, um, uh, by evaluating this equation. And my mouse is sometimes, by evaluating this equation. I have these um, weights, which at the beginning are random values. And I take some example from the set D and I multiply my weights with the respective dimensions of this feature vector. Also expressed as dot project here. Uh, w is, is the weight of this feature here. Yeah. yeah, okay. Um, a good that you ask is, um, if you see bold X and non-bold X or um, capitalized, capitalized, uh, capitalized or um, slanted um, characters, these have, they are, these are carefully chosen. This is a bold X, which means this is a vector. Sorry. So this is a vector. And this here is one dimension of the vector. Okay. And uh, this multiplication here is a scalar product. And this multiplication here is a multiplication of a constant with a vector. It means here again, this is a vector. And here, the entire feature vector is updated with this difference value. Okay. That means when I, when I ask you before whether you like formal descriptions, they, sh they shall help us. We do not we do introduce the formal notation to make it complicated. We introduce it to make it Simple. And if it does not work out, please give us a hint. We will explain. Yes, exactly. This is a kind of um, a meter parameter. And um, in fact, it does not um, decide uh, 
on the on the quality of the learning, but only a bit on the speed. So, but ETA cannot be very large, I guess, if we put no, it into no. two or something, this would not help. Oh, no, yes, if, if, if it's um, to, to tell a bit from the background, if you choose it too large, the, the process becomes oscillating. That means um, going over and down. Yes. Um, in doubt without it at all. Yeah. <laughs> Um, this is this is not a big thing. It is um, uh, shown here because to make the example complete, but um, yes. um, there's nothing to learn from here at the moment. The interesting thing to learn is and that this rather primitive uh, algorithm is not so primitive at all, because what you see here, in fact, is a solution of a quadratic problem and uh, we see here the derivation which is still linear which shows that it comes uh, from a quadratic loss function. We will derive this and it looks so harmless but it is not. For those who have uh, some mathematical background, so convergence uh, velocity, the convergence speed is not so high. This is um, far behind um, a Newton uh, solution uh, which has order uh, convergence order two. This is uh, the lowest converger order which is possible here. Uh, but anyway, we have computing power and we can apply this primitive algorithm and uh, it will do a good job. Another small interruption. Um, yeah. There was another question uh, just to re-explain what D is. I, will, I can take this and uh, yeah, please, please. I will just say that D is a set of examples that we have. Uh, and the example is uh, the fat X, which is the representation of some real world objects like our email. And uh, uh, together with the class it belongs to, the S defined as determined by our classifier function. Yes, Benno marked it already, CX. So D is a set of training examples. And it could be large or small, dependent on um, how, how much time we want to invest getting them. Okay. Mm. I move on. Um, what comes next is um, a compilation of what we think of famous elements in machine learning you might have heard and you should know about if you read um, secondary literature. And you should also know that we consider these things. They go partly beyond this reading, partly they are treated. The first element which we have shown here is the model formation thing. We have to go from the real world into a feature space. Many books and many tasks directly start here. They give you a set of features, or let's say feature vectors, and they learn something from this. But if you are in the real world and you are a programmer or you are a problem solver for a company, they will say, we want to do something with machine learning. This is what I hear quite often. They give you some example of their business. This can be a uh, production situation, this can be assessment, this can be letter reading, this can be something. You want to learn something from this. Then you are at first here, you are in the real world and you have to find out what they want to do with this. And you have to abstract from the real world onto a description that can be processed. For instance, you would work at Amazon and they ask you, we want to learn from our reviews whether they are useful or not. They do not give you a feature vector. They say, select those features from a review where you can learn this from. And then you see you have a big problem. What are the features in a review that tell me that the review is a useful review? Yes, it uses exactly this in order to find out whether a review is positive or negative towards the object. It uses someone, someone sat down and asked themselves, how can I find out if the text is positive or negative? 
And then they also came up with ways to do this. For example, they ask how many positive words or positive words with positive connotation are in the review and how many, are, how many have a negative connotation. And counting those and then applying, for example, the LMS algorithm, they found they can maybe to some extent distinguish this. Sentiment analysis has come a long way. Uh, uh, there's a lot of technology that went into it, but it's quite possible to do this now. Very similar problem. You could think about a review that it's not useful if it contains offending words. You can count offending words and take this as a feature. And the learning algorithm will find out the fewer offending words you have, the better the review is. This observation, yes, this is called label noise. And this tells us that the model is not strong enough. And we will, we will learn about this in, in the bias variance decomposition, which we will all do, that we have to pay a price. Even if you have a fantastic model, you, you, you develop all these features, you have an idea of all these features, and you develop for a review, let's take this example, about 1,000 features that capture fantastic how the usefulness is. You will have problems to get enough examples to exploit the model, to find the weights for your features. The more features you introduce, the more you have to learn. And the so-called bias variance trade-off tells us something about this. The more bias means the less features. You can easily learn this. However, we, we do assume that C is a function that we may not be able to write down, but it is a function nonetheless that does the correct translation regardless of whether we map objects that belong to different classes to the same feature vector, right? We do mm. consider this. So it is, it is perhaps a little bit of a deviation from the mathematical uh, uh, desi de de desirability of, of a function to be that clear. We just, we just represent the function in the end by the examples that we collect in the set D. Okay, um, perhaps we do a task or um, exercise on this. You might, yes. Um, the next element, we are in the elements of machine learning. This is um, what um, we have developed here for you, is a classification or organization scheme of um, learning algorithms such as the LMS algorithm. We have uh, some data, you see it here. Our task is classification. And now we can think about our algorithms consisting of following components, namely a model function. This was in the LMS situation, a linear model. And we have to, had to choose a certain linear model from the space of all linear functions. We call the room from which we take our model function, the hypothesis space. These are all possible hypotheses we consider. A hypothesis is the function that explains the data, that captures the connection between the features and the class. And the first decision that you have to do is to choose useful data. The second decision is to choose a class of models. The class of models defines your hypothesis space. This is shown here on this side. The model function defines the hypothesis space. The next thing is that you have to do something with the data and the set of possible model functions. You have to find the optimum. What is the best instance, the best model function in the hypothesis space is regarding 
to performance feature. And um, the performance feature we had in the LMS algorithm was that we measure this error. And finally, when we have measured the performance, we want to quickly find, efficiently and effectively find the best element in the hypothesis space. And this is done with some optimization. And we can do this with stochastic gradient descent if you have a convex problem set. This is the second element of machine learning. How to set up a learning algorithm? Yeah, related questions. The third element, which you should understand, is that a feature space can have many different forms. The feature space in the LMS algorithm is an inner product space. So to say it simply, you can compute the scalar product. But if you recall back our examples, for instance, the example of the credit or the loan assignment, you see that this was not an inner product space, it was symbolic. And hence, we demonstrate here as a second kind of feature space, a feature space called sigma algebra, where we can define a probability measure on. These feature spaces are called sigma algebras. Simply think about something we can work with probabilities. And if you are completely free, we only think about sets. We have feature vectors that have nominal dimensions. We have no idea how these feature vectors relate to each other. And um, what you see here from top to bottom is that the feature space loses structure. And uh, many problems require a fe uh, feature space that is an inner product space. Uh, LMS algorithm is one example. Neural networks is one example. Support vector machines. Um, discriminant analysis according to Fisher. If you don't have this, and you are happy, you can still do statistics. And even if you don't have this, you have to do something. Your learning algorithm has no structure to learn from, and this makes it more expensive to run. And we will, we will work on all three fields so that you get an idea um, how to cope with such problems. In this regard, and here shown as the fourth element of machine learning, is a distinction between discrimination and generation, which means real understanding. Normally, you have the situation on the left. You have negative examples, you have positive examples, and you simply want to find out a separating line, a hyperplane, a border, a barrier. This is called discriminative approach. We only want to discriminate between minus and plus. This is a very primitive approach in that sense that we do not understand the data. If we would like to understand the data, look on the right hand side, we want to look at the distribution. We are hinted as a Gaussian line. That means it, we have here some expectation values. And if we now get a new example, we can exploit, exploit the probabilities which we have modeled here we have, because we understand the data, because we understand the distributions which are underlying and can say something about the probability that this example belongs here or here. In the discriminative approach, which is quite primitive, we look only 
on which side you are. By saying this, it is becomes clear that if we know a lot about our data, we are very happy. But in this regard, we have to compute and to find out the distributions. And um, there are many situations where we cannot do this and we do a very primitive discrimination. If I go back now a few slides, I can tell you most of machine learning that you have seen is an inner product space, takes a linear model and does discrimination. But this is only a very small branch of machine learning altogether. Finally, and this will also uh, close the reading, I give you the fifth element. But uh, first I would uh, demonstrate why we have such kind of a fifth element um, which is coming more. All these learning situations which I have described by now show you situations where we have a lot of data where we want to learn from. Today, in these days, we want to find out who is going to win the election in the US. Or we want to ask ourselves, will there be a third lockdown? Or we want to think about what is the best to surprise my partner this evening. These are things that can be learned, but not so easily. And the more you think about these kind of problems, you will see that machine learning like many people treat this is a very primitive thing. It deals with situations like this. You have positive examples, you have negative examples, and we draw a hyperplane. And um, many problems are not of this kind. And now we have two ways to cope with this. Either to press them into this form. For instance, is this a useful um, review can be modeled deciding whether the feature vectors belong to a plus side or a minus side regarding some sentiment words. What we can also do is to go to um, another way of thinking. About there, was, there was apparently a small sound yeah. break for at least a handful of people, Benno. Um, ah, I see. Yeah. It's, it's, I think yeah. we have, we have, we should have the recording. There was no sound break at my end. So I guess it yeah. is okay if people go back there, but sorry for interrupting you, but I just wanted to let and you know. If no, no, no worries. There's it's a main okay. point yeah. you want to repeat. We are coming uh, close to the end. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah. I want to, to, to show with the fifth element of machine learning. Um, yeah. um, it's also a famous film, the fifth element, I guess, um, uh, that uh, there is uh, the, this, what many people show as machine learning is a very primitive part of, and which can only solve very specific situations. And so um, we yeah. will have we will have an example of both discriminative and generative machine learning in the lecture because one person was answering and wanting the fun stuff on the right side. Ah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry that I, um, I I I'm happy that Martin, you and others um, follow the uh, the chat because I. I, I cannot do this so good at the moment. Anyway, yeah. I will- no, stay focused, you. we will just interrupt you. Um, okay, there's a fantastic video uh, to, which illustrates the pros and cons of discriminative and generative approaches. The best video I've found so far, it is simply linked. I um, suggest all of you, please read carefully our remarks. We present only links that are really useful. We do our best there. Take a look at it, you can learn a, a lot of it. Uh, I found it fantastic. It is an excellent explanation. And it's the best I have ever seen. Okay, let's come to the fifth element, frequentism versus subjectivism. For those of you who have heard statistics and more in statistics, they know there are various approaches to, to capture probabilities. And this is uh, a plus, uh, the plus in view, the frequentism view. And this is also the, the base view, it's called subjectivism. And to understand what's behind this, I have presented two situations. 
the typical frequentism situation and the typical subjectivism situation. And the typical frequentism situation is that we are in the situation that we can enough data frequency. Yeah, we, we can do something with frequencies, we can count. And uh, we can generate data from a situation that has a mechanism which we don't understand. For instance, if we are flipping a coin or if we are doing another gambling thing or if we are taking a car and crushing it against the wall, we don't know exactly what happens. And if we can repeat the experiment times and times and times, we can generate data. And then we have done this before with a chess. We can think about to model this data. Uh, we can think about the parameterization of the model. This was a feature vector uh, W beforehand. And we can select the most probable hypothesis, the most probable explanation by using our data and producing the loss, the error, or what you want to say is. That means what we are doing, taking the data, we are looking for a hypothesis. It is most likely. If this hypothesis holds, the probability of observing the data is maximum. This is called maximum likelihood approach. And the hypothesis is called maximum likelihood hypothesis. And in fact, what we did here is such a maximum likelihood thing. I present you this because this is not all. I give you examples who is going to win the election. Do we have a third lockdown? We cannot apply frequentism. We have no 10,000 Corona situations. We have no 10,000 US elections. We cannot play this then. And in this situation, it is necessary to bring in our knowledge. And hence the subjectivistic approach is often seen at the moment as a more important approach and to make machines intelligent. I will take the same example to show what I mean with this. Again, we have to do something with a coin. This is a person here who offers you a game. He brings a coin and says, if head comes up, you get $10. If tail comes up, you lose only one. Would you take this game? And this depends upon your assessment whether he's not fooling, whether he's not cheating, whether this coin is fair. And here, does no frequentism helps you? You have to decide. You have a belief. Here you see the belief one. This, it means with 95%, you say the coin is fair. The probability of getting it is 50%. Other people might think the probability that the coin is not fair, getting it is 75%. Uh, that means 75% um, uh, head is coming first, and 50% uh, of the people believe this. What to do now? You see such an example of beliefs and bets if you look at the stock exchange. There are people who think, for instance, that Google or Amazon will still raise in their value and other people don't believe this. There are different beliefs about a parameter vector that characterizes the model. I go back. Here, we learned a model. We learned theta. Here, we are arguing about beliefs about a model. And this is something we have to do very often. For instance, we get a text and want to decide, is this plagiarism or not? 
And this cannot be simply solved with a frequentistic approach. Instead, you have to compute something which we call maximum a posteriori hypothesis. It is a complicated word, but at heart, it is the application of base rule. It works like follows. You take this coin and let it somebody throw it a few times. Then you check your belief with this and you get the probability for your belief. If this, let's say it is three times tossed, always three times set, you might get the idea that this is a coin which is not fair. Also the other person with the other belief will do this. And then you choose from the hypothesis those that brings the maximum from your prior, prior belief, what you observed, and this here in the denominator is a constant. And this is what I do if I have to do complicated decisions. My TA stuff is helping me to compute this here. This is my personal opinion, which I have in a certain field, which is really strong or not, which I apply. And then I compute this. We will do this at least in one lesson when we apply the naive base algorithm. Okay, that's all for, from these uh, elements of machine learning. And I've chose these five because they span a extreme wide range of what happens. I still want to repeat this well, because for me, this is important that you get this idea. If we, if we talk perhaps later on in research about machine learning, I will ask you, do you believe in the model? I will ask you, is a model function not over complex? Is it well selected with regard to the data that you have? I will ask you, do we exploit the feature space? I will ask you, can't we get these distributions here? I will ask you about your beliefs. And when I put all these together, I get a really strong decision. And if we're talking about AI, that means intelligent programs, they are able to master all this. Perhaps you have seen the Jeopardy, or you have seen Watson, this IBM technology to behave intelligent in, in games and quiz shows. And of course, they combined everything of what you have seen here. Okay, that's all I have to tell. And today you have recognized this, it was more like a reading. And in future, we won't have time to do this because we will give you a lot of material, but we will go in this discussion and presentation into the critical or difficult things. But we will not spend uh, that time that we have spent now slide by slide. In, in this regard, yes, I want to repeat uh, that we will give you a, a forum where you can formulate your questions. So you will know ahead of time what to prepare for, for the next session, like which slides and perhaps book chapters to read. And then you can, when you prepare for the uh, lecture, formulate your questions and ideally already post them in the forum, like in the Moodle forum that we have prepared for you. And this will give us the opportunity to also prepare our answers. Uh, this way uh, we can, it is perhaps easier than just asking now whether you have questions, which we will do anyway, um, uh, uh, and waiting for you to type. So please prepare for these sessions. So, are there questions? Yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Regarding the task that we will um, work with you through, um, our ambitious goal is that we have this single task, the, the classification of web pages, and apply different algorithms, machine learning principles in this, so that you learn step by step 
what you do differently. So, um, we will not stop the session now. Uh, please stay in the session. Uh, I guess we can have still uh, answer questions if you have them now. Um, but we will also, uh, let's say, do five, ten minutes, I'm not sure, five minutes bio break. So you can go get something to drink or do something else uh, just for, the, for a little bit of relaxation. And then we can continue with the um, introduction to the exercise sheet and afterwards with the introduction to the lab class, especially for the Weimar people, because the Leipzig people already got an introduction last week. However, you can stay around if you haven't got the introduction or if you uh, want to hear it again. Okay, questions anyway. Okay, then I... I'm going out. I want to say thank you for being here. And um, we are looking forward. Um, for the time planning, I think I would say the next um, lectures won't take so much time like today. We will have less technical problems in the beginning and we will go quicker through the slides. And um, we are thinking about one to 30 minutes to up to one and a half hours per lecture normally, something like this in between. Yes.